So thank you all for coming. Um, as with each of our lectures here at the Silver Sides, we always begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Then immediately after the Pledge of Allegiance, I will ask you to please mute your screen and um, so that there is no feedback and no sound. And um, please feel free if you wish to keep your camera on or turn it off, that is completely up to you. If you have any questions, I ask that you put them in the chat at the bottom of the screen. And if our presenter has a chance to the end, when I will ask you to unmute yourself and we will enter into a lively discussion after we are finished. Um, so without further ado, I will ask everyone to please say the Pledge of Allegiance. One moment here. Allegiance for the flag yeah. of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Oh. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Our series sponsor tonight is the Lorraine F. Birch and the Fred S. Birch Jr. Foundation. They are a local West Michigan company who met and married during World War II and after their military careers came back and took on careers of public service. It is through them and their feelings that promoting public service at the community, state, and federal level through education is ideal to making our society. And this evening is Blue Lake Public Radio, a wonderful organization that has been our supporter for years, and we thank them for that. Next week's lecture on April 5th, I can't possibly imagine it is April already, is the Reclamation of Power from 1990 to 1992. There are a lot of different things going on. The United States, oh, I don't wanna let it out as to how tonight's event ends, but I believe that there was some successes that will be talked about. And, um, but it didn't mean that all the world's problems were solved and that the United States military is not actively engaged in other conflicts around the world. And so we will be looking at a lot of what NATO forces were doing during that time period. And it should be another exciting, interesting lecture that we'll be having. Tonight's presentation will be by Ron Janowski. It is about Operation Desert Storm that has set the gold standard for what we would like to continue doing, but it had its own set of problems and it had a lot of different things and it changed the way a lot of Americans looked at the military. And there was a lot of military veterans that are from that time point and they talk about the difficulties of fighting in that area, that era and that type of environment. And it opened up the door for a lot of things that will be happening in the United States during the rest of our series. Tonight's speaker is Ron Janowski, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, retired. Ron is a 1976 graduate of the United States Military Academy at Grass Point. He holds a master's in history from Norwich University. He has been um, in the military for, he was in the military for many years. He was actually, as he puts it, an Army brand and traveled extensively throughout his life. After his um, professional career in the military, he taught ROTC, oh, back in 2013, when he gave his first lecture at the Silversides. And from that point on, we have loved him. We think he is a wonderful speaker and we cannot get enough of him. So without further ado, I will hand the screen over to Ron. While Ron is putting up his PowerPoint, I ask that everyone please mute yourself. And if not, then I will mute everyone because it is an important thing so that we can all hear each other. All right. And so Ron, you should be able to share your screen. All right. Thank you, Peggy. Everybody see a green screen right now? Yes, we all see okay. a green screen.
The Middle East, the land known as the Middle East, has throughout the ages been something of a magnet attracting historical events. We know, of course, that the Romans occupied Judea and the Palestine in the time of Christ. A thousand years later, Western European crusaders came into the area to rescue the land from the Islamic host. In 1859, the British came in and connected the Atlantic to the Indian Oceans through the Suez Canal, which of course has been in the news this week as Kurt and I were just talking about. During World War I, once again, the Grand Entente mobilized the people of the Middle East to help in the Great War. 20 years after that, the Germans returned the favor coming south, seeking the oil reserves, the vast oil reserves that lay under the sands of the Middle East to power their war machine. In 1948, the country of Israel was founded. Much more recently, uh, another adventure began with outside forces coming to the Middle East. It was an intent not to simply change a political standard in the Middle East, but in fact to advent the coming of a new political paradigm for all the world. In January and February of 1991, this was Operation Desert Storm. Desert Storm was coming upon us just as an old paradigm was ending. For 40 years, the world had existed under the Cold War, a bipolar situation in which East versus West, capitalism versus communism, the United States versus the Soviet Union. It was a very stable, if terrifying, paradigm. But finally, in 1989, under the pressure of, the, of trying to keep up, the Russian-Soviet economy collapsed, leaving suddenly the world realizing that a great era had ended. For the United States being the last man standing in this grand chess match, it seemed an opportunity for change, for a perhaps a utopia in which countries could work together in harmony, in mutual progress. Then US President George Bush Sr. called it the New World Order and loosely defined it would be a case in which the countries of the world, united under the banner of the United Nations, would finally be able to fulfill the promise of the United Nations and its predecessor even, the League of Nations, in working together in harmony and finding peace in progress. Of course, the US being the final remaining uh, superpower would provide implicit leadership, its power, providing the impetus to success. Unfortunately, as most utopias are bound to do, the dream of a new world order of this definition would prove to be fleeting and would ultimately not come to be. Welcome to the USS Silverside Spring 2021 Lecture Series, New World Order Exposed. And tonight we will be discussing Operation Desert Storm. I will be your host, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Ron Janowski. Glad to be back. The Middle East, a meeting of continents, a meeting of cultures, it has long drawn the attention of the world for various reasons, religious, economic, but most recently, its draw has been the vast reservoirs of oil beneath its sands. Oil has become the driving lifeblood of industrialized nations around the world. And for that reason, the United States and many others established alliances and treaties with the major powers of the Middle East. The United States was no different. 
In the late 1970s, it had established treaties with both of the biggest of the producers, Saudi Arabia and Iran. In Saudi Arabia, a relationship, an alliance was set up with a Saudi family in the person of King Abdullah. The Saudis had long been in power in Saudi Arabia and even today remain a relatively stable agent of peace in the region. To the north, Iran was under the authority of Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. The Shah's family had been in power since the 1920s. The Shah himself had been in, in authority since the 1950s. But in the late 1970s, after over 25 years in power, the Shah and Iran were facing upheaval. The Shah was facing medical issues, and he had, because of a number of questionable, outright poor decisions on his part, and the rising tide of a fundamentalist movement within Iran, the Shah's power was threatened. And in 1977, 78, 79, he departed for the United States for medical treatment, never to return. And instead, the authority of the Shah and the power in Iran transferred over to a fundamentalist power run by Ayatollahs or holy men. The leader of these was the Ayatollah Khomeini. Further complicating the issue in the area was the fact that the Middle East is the meeting to sects of Islam. In Iran and across to Iraq is the Shiite sect. To the south is the Sunni sect. While both trace their heritage and their lineage to Muhammad in 631 AD, both have taken a different path and their principles are quite different in their reflection upon the Islamic religion. There is outright hostility between the two sects. It was feared that with the power of the Ayatollah Khomeini and the Sunnis, I should say the Shiites to the north, that there may be cause for an expansion of aggression to the south, thus upsetting the stability of the area and thereby threatening the flow of oil to the world. The United States and others looked to the natural boundary or wedge, both politically and physically appearing as a wedge in the country of Iran. The authority in Iran was a man by the name of Saddam Hussein. And he, although being a Sunni ruling a Shiite nation, he kept it under control by a strong fisted management and his Ba'ath party controlled the country tightly. Nevertheless, he was the benefactor or the bene he was the receiver of the money and aid that were coming in from around the world, particularly from the two superpowers. The United States aid was coming primarily in the form of economic aid. Russian or Soviet aid was coming in the form of military equipment. As a result, by the late 1970s and early 1980, Saddam Hussein, an ambitious man, had a robust economy and the fourth largest military in the world. He knew that the power of oil could only increase his authority in the world and the region. And his intention was to be the strong man of the Middle East. Iran, just to his east, had just gone through a revolution and they were in turmoil. There was chaos. Saddam Hussein knew that if he could acquire more oil, he could become yet more powerful. And he looked to the east just across the border and saw a sizable area of rich oil production in Iran that was simply there for the taking. A second item that Saddam Hussein was interested in at this time was increased, increased access to the world waterways. The closest waterways, as we can see just to the south, is the Persian Gulf. But as we can also see, the land that 
accesses you can also see that the Iranian access to the Persian Gulf is a thin sliver of land. Saddam Hussein felt that if he could access and move into the land of the Iranians, he could just as easily take their seacoast as well as their oil production area. As fate would have it, there is an Iranian province which perfectly fit the bill. The province of Kujistan had the oil production. It also would provide a much enhanced water access for Saddam Hussein. So without much ado, in September of 1980, Saddam Hussein launched into an invasion of Iran with his full military capabilities. Iran initially was in fact in chaos, but ironically enough, the harder Saddam Hussein pushed, the more it united the Iranian people. Saddam soon found himself in a situation where he was stuck half in and half out. He was able to fight his way into Iran, but he, found, he soon found that he was unable to extricate himself. Being a man of some ambition and imagination, he fell back on every possible means of utilizing military power. And what he created, and Fred Johnson has mentioned this in his past presentations, was a recreation of all of the worst of World War I, trench warfare. Saddam also created the conditions for gas warfare. And for years, the sides were locked in brutal and deadly combat, unable to go forward, unable to go back. Saddam bested World War I in the time that he got locked in. Whereas World War I lasted four years, Saddam and Iran stretched this out to a full eight years of horror. By July of 1988, Hussein was finally able to extricate himself and found himself exactly where he had begun. No further, no gain, no loss. The border was the same, and he was left without the oil and the sea port that he desired. It offered itself suddenly, perhaps as a easier access point to the Southwest, to the Southeast, the sovereign kingdom of Kuwait. Now Kuwait had been formed after World War I from remnants of the Austro-Hungarian Empire or from the Turkish Empire. For that reason, Saddam was able to argue that in fact Kuwait was a lost province of Iraq and deserved not to be separate at all. He bolstered this further by claiming that I, Kuwait, through its rich oil, was actually stealing oil from Iraq through a process known as slant drilling. In this, an oil well is simply drilled at a 45 degree angle across an international border and is taking the oil of another country into their own. This, Saddam declared pompously, could not be stood for. And he demanded that Kuwait, in fact, surrender to, uh, to his advances with several billion dollars, something like $10 billion worth of ransom. The Kuwaitis offered 500,000, at which point Saddam declared that not only would he get justice, but he would in fact claim Kuwait as the 19th province of Iraq. Of course, this was all going on in the public eye and there was much discussion throughout the world and particularly the region. Nevertheless, Saddam moved his forces to the Kuwaiti border. And on the 2nd of August, 1980, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Now Kuwait had a military, but it was, it was nothing compared to what Saddam Hussein had in Iraq. They were quickly overcome 
and Iraq claimed the, claimed the land that was once Kuwait. World opinion was quick to respond with Iraqi forces in Kuwait. United Nations immediately that day formed a security council and condemned Iraq for its actions. A few days later, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, recognizing the threat posed by Hussein, called upon the United States and requested US aid to protect and to shield Saudi Arabia from Hussein's advances. On the 8th of August, Saddam made good his promise and annexed Kuwait. American President George Bush Sr. was quick to respond to, Saddam, to Saudi's request for aid. He too wanted to stop Saddam Hussein from disrupting the peace in the nation and the, in the region. He quickly started pulling together assets to create what would be called a shield, desert shield. His point man on this would be his secretary of state, James Baker. Baker soon embarked on what would be called the tin cup trip in which over the period of 11 days, he would visit nine different countries in order to try to bolster support and bring together a coalition of forces to fight back against Iraq's aggressions. The first two countries he visited, naturally enough, were Saudi Arabia, and he visited with the Emir of Kuwait, who was exiled in Saudi Arabia. Both men were approached and asked if they would help fund the effort. Both readily agreed, each contributing $15 billion each to the effort. More money was to come from elsewhere, but this, this $30 billion was the lion's share that funded Operation Desert Shield and later Operation Desert Storm. Baker went on to speak to many other nations, but no, none were more important than his visit in Finland with representatives of the Soviet Union. The Soviets were well on their way to dissolution at this point, although that was not evident at the time. But they declined to participate in Desert Shield or Storm. They did not agree with Iraq's invasion, but nevertheless, they did agree to step back and not interfere. What transpired was that finally Baker and George Bush, the president, were able to coalesce a group of 39 nations from almost every continent in the, on the globe. These 39 provided various sizes of military personnel and equipment to join the United States and the Saudi Arabia. Germany and Japan were barred by law to, from providing military forces outside their country, but they each provided approximately $8 billion towards the effort. The coalition ultimately reached just under 1 million men under arms. 700,000 of those were US forces. This balanced well against Saddam's force of nearly two thirds of a million soldiers. During the time that this buildup was occurring and forces were arriving in Saudi Arabia, Saddam Hussein was faced with the challenge to either face up to this military force or to withdraw. Over that period, he made several offers to withdraw. In the first case, he offered to withdraw from Palestine or withdraw from Kuwait if Israel would withdraw from Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon. President Bush outright denied this possibility as a linkage with Kuwaiti, or I should say Iraqi invasion of Kuwait was not the equivalent as, as really of Israeli holdings in Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon. 
Next, Saddam declared that he wished the replacement of all US forces, the 700,000 that were gathering in Saudi Arabia with a pure Arab force, which would be much more fitting to deal with any issues in the Middle East. This too was refused by all sides in the coalition. And finally, of course, there were sanctions that have been laid down upon Iraq by the UN declaration of uh, uh, sanctioning. Saddam wanted all of those lifted and he would consider re removing himself from Kuwait. All of these were self-serving and all were denied. And in November, President Bush, Bush on the 29th of November with the UN resolution 678 in hand declared an ultimatum. By the 16th of January, Saddam must be out of Kuwait with a declaration of, uh, with a confirmation of Kuwaiti sovereignty or face the consequences. Saddam felt secure and he stayed in place. As a result, on the morning of 17, the 17th of January, 1991, Desert Shield transformed into Desert Storm. And starting at four o'clock in the morning on the 17th, U.S. warships in the Persian Gulf started launching Tomahawk cruise missiles into Iraq. The cruise missile is a phenomenal thing. It is a direct descendant of the missiles fired, the V-1s fired by the Germans into London back in 1944. But with all of the assets of modernization that you can imagine, the cruise missile is about 16 feet in length. It is launched from a tube, so it can be launched from a naval ship or from a submarine. And a variant is also launched from Air Force aircraft. It travels at about three quarters the speed of sound and carries a thousand pound warhead. It can travel about 800 miles further now, but at this time it had a range of about 800 miles and a circular error of probability of 16 feet. Now, quite simply, that means that if a cruise missile had been launched from Grand Rapids, about one hour later, it could arrive in New York City and drop a thousand pounds in Times Square and hit a dumpster. Every time. It is a phenomenal weapon. And it, is, it was beyond the comprehension of the Saudis when they took on this, this opponent. Or perhaps it was known, perhaps this is why uh, Saddam Hussein wanted an all Arab force to replace the Americans. The Americans over the past decade had built up an incredible array of weaponry that which we'll talk about in a moment. But the next one was not only were cruise missiles filling the air, but so was the American stealth fighter, the F-117 Nighthawk. This incredible aircraft was designed in its shapes and material to not reflect radars. So as a result, instead of showing up on radars as a full-size aircraft, it shows up as something in the equivalent of a small bird. As a result, some of the pictures you see on the right upper right corner were coming off of CNN showing Baghdad anti-aircraft fruitlessly trying to shoot down the aircraft they knew were up there, but could not find them. This was the strength of the F-117. Incidentally, over the course of the seven weeks of uh, Desert Storm, about 88,000 tons of munitions would be dropped by coalition aircraft. That's roughly one half of the tonnage dropped by all US Army Air Corps bombers during World War II. The bombings attracted by the Tomahawks peppered the entire country of Iraq, north, south, east, and west. Pentagon public affairs officers, when describing this, termed it a, an operation of shock and awe. 
And it was. Each night, we were able to watch these incredible pictures of the bombardment that were coming in that the Iraqis simply had no answer for. They couldn't shoot down the cruise missiles. They couldn't find the F-117s. And these came in each night filling our TV screens. I say night. I was in Europe at the time, and I was manning a missile system that was aimed at Russia, as a matter of fact, to make sure that they didn't do anything untoward. But we had the TVs on all night watching this stuff, and it was just incredible. Shock and awe implies a kind of a uh, rock and roll uh, firework display. But in fact, Operation Desert Storm was an incredibly well-planned and well-executed operation that US forces had been preparing for many years. In fact, many more years than Saddam had even been in power. And I'll explain that in a moment. It was a three-phase operation. First being the knocking out of any defense systems by the Iraqis. Their air force and anti-aircraft uh, equipment were the first target of these munitions, followed by their command and control. Saddam was notoriously, uh, he was notorious in his micromanagement of the military. And that extended well down, you know, pretty much at the top of the military system. Their, their individual initiative at the smaller unit level was less likely. And so knocking out the command and control in the Iraqi headquarters uh, would essentially uh, decapitate the, uh, the military capabilities of Iraq. And then finally, once the defense was down, the command and control were, were screwed up, uh, military targets such as surface to surface missiles, research and development, and naval assets were all hit. It was an extremely well-planned and executed operation that took the Iraqi military to its knees in short order. Saddam was nothing if not imaginative, however, and he had a couple of innovative things that he tried to do to throw off the crisp clockwork of the coalition forces. The first was Iraq on the day that the fighting began, the day uh, that the first of the Tomahawks started landing, Iraq started attacking Israel using Russian-built surface-to-air missiles nicknamed SCUDs. A total of eight were fired that first day, hitting targets in Israel. Now, what's innovative about this is that Israel was not part of the coalition. It was not that Israel wouldn't have loved to have jumped into a good fight. But the fact was, President Bush requested that the Israelis not be part of the coalition. It was feared that if there was a case, as there was, where Arab countries were fighting against Iraq, another Arab country, if an Israeli or Jewish state joined in the fight and the Arab countries had to align through the coalition, with a Jewish state against a fellow Arab country, it might well fracture, if not shatter, the coalition. Therefore, President Bush requested that Israel stand down and simply absorb these attacks. Eight were fired the first day. Over the seven weeks, 88 were fired into Israel, others into Saudi Arabia. But they were essentially well, they didn't lend much to the final conclusion of the war for the sake, for the very fact that SCUDs are incredibly inaccurate. Like the cruise missile was a direct descendant of the V-1, SCUDs are a direct descendant of the old V-2s, which were launched by Germany against London. They are essentially a rocket propelled, propelled artillery piece. Once they leave the ground, there is no guidance from below try to guide them into their, their target. As a result, although it had a hefty one-ton warhead, it could only travel about 375 miles, and it had a circular error of probability of 300 yards, meaning that once fired, it could hit maybe within three football fields of its intended target. 
Now, some of them did hit their targets. Many did not. And in fact, the Israelis had developed an anti-aircraft system called the Iron Dome, which helped knock out a lot of these. But the task of trying to find the Scuds before they launched was an ongoing problem that harried the coalition throughout the early days of the, uh, of the war. The problem being that the Russians had designed the system such that it was mounted on a wheeled platform. So they could very quickly raise the missile, fire it, and scoot away before it could be found and knocked down. Again, because of the accuracy issues with the Scud, however, it proved to be of limited use and the Israelis happily and thankfully stayed out of the fight of Desert Storm. On the 29th of January, the Iraqis mounted their first and what would prove to be their only offensive land action of the war. Just to the south of Kuwait is the Saudi Arabian city of Kafji on the Persian Gulf. On the 29th, the Iraqis mounted a two division thrust of armor and mechanized infantry towards Kafji. Unfortunately for the Iraqis, they were seen. One of the weapon systems that the United States brought to Operation Desert Storm was a weapon system that had no weapons on it whatsoever. The Airborne Early Warning and Command System, AWACS, is a converted 707 with a very prominent radar dome mounted on its spine. Within the aircraft is an array of computers, communications, and radar equipment. And the AWACS is able to identify threats in a 360 degree range throughout a region, identifying land threats and air threats, and quickly coordinating friendly response to a number of threats, which it can handle multiply. In this particular case, the AWACS zoomed in on the Kafji excursion by the Iraqis and quickly coordinated over three, over 140 coalition aircraft of air to ground to attack the Iraqi columns. In short order, the Iraqis had devastating losses of 357 tanks, 147 armored personnel carriers, and 89 self-propelled artilleries. The devastation was extremely one-sided. And later, an Iraqi survivor of the Battle of Kafji was interviewed by, by coalition uh, military intelligence interviewers. And he was quoted as saying that more hit him in 30 minutes than in eight years fighting in Iran. It was a huge testament to not only the ability of AWACS to coordinate massive amounts of aircraft onto a target, but also the capabilities in general of the coalition forces against the Iraqis. The next thing that Saddam tried doing to throw off the coalition gain was identified on the 8th of February, when satellite imagery started showing black plumes of burning oil in Kuwait. This escalated until by the 20th, 22nd to the 24th of February, it peaked with nearly 85% of Kuwait capacity flaming and burning in the Kuwaiti desert. What Saddam had hoped to achieve by this is not really known whether it was intended as a means of distracting the coalition, perhaps causing health hazards, which it did, or simply the mother of all smoke screens. It created an enormous health risk, but very little else as the coalition was still able to execute its operations continuously. Some of the risks that were uh, visited upon uh, the health of the soldiers of both sides during the war 
were registered years later uh, in VA clinics all across the United States. It gave cause for Saddam Hussein to later be charged with criminal war, war crime uh, by his own people. And this was one of the charges, the lighting up of the Kuwaiti oil fields. The flaming was so, so heavy that in fact, the final capping didn't happen until several months after Desert Storm was over. Along the way, Saddam would offer reasons or possible palm leaves to withdraw from Kuwait. On the 15th of February, he proposed to withdraw, but would not concede that Kuwait was not a part of Iraq. All of these were turned away as unacceptable. And on the 22nd of February, President Bush finally gave Saddam Hussein his final ultimatum. He had 24 hours for an unconditional surrender to withdraw from Kuwait and to abandon the claim of Kuwait's land as, as Iraqi. 24 hours came, 24 hours left. And Saddam was now subject to biggest butt whipping ever. The Iraqi forces were coalesced in Kuwait. Coalition forces had arrayed themselves along the border of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, just inside Saudi Arabia. On the 24th of February, the trap was sprung. And coalition forces flooded across the Iraqi desert, completely enveloping the Iraqi forces in Kuwait. Several feints had been made to imply that the major attack would be directly from the south into Kuwait City, and therefore Saddam was not prepared for the broad sweeping motions across the Iraqi desert to his west. This was an operation of incredible complexity, and this is another picture of the same area showing the various units that were involved. You can recognize many of you, I'm sure, uh, division patches of the 25th, um, the 101st, the 82nd. Uh, there is the, uh, the 24th, the 1st Cav, the 1st Armored, the 3rd Armored. There are Marines, there are uh, Egyptian, there are Marine forces, there are uh, I, 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 Iraqi, for, um, I should say, uh, uh, Egyptian forces, Saudi Arabian forces, British forces, French forces. It was an incredible movement carried out across the sands of Iraq, quickly enveloping the Iraqi army. Spearheading this effort were weapons such as the AWACS the premier close air support Warthog, the uh, stealth fighter, the F-117 Nighthawk, and on the ground, equally impressive state-of-the-art weaponry that had been developed just been within the past decade or so. The Abrams tank, which could run at 60 miles an hour across uneven terrain, locking in on a target a mile away and hitting with pinpoint accuracy with depleted uranium rounds, traveling at a mile a second. The Bradley fighting vehicle, designed to keep up with the Abrams advance, carrying squads of infantry and the artillery, multiple launched rocket system, an, a single weapon system that could equal the size and the firepower of an entire battalion of previous uh, uh, earlier artillery, each of 12 rockets carrying 677 rounds of munitions for a total of some 1,700 rounds that could completely blanket a grid square of a thousand feet, a thousand meters by a thousand meters. These were incredible weapon systems, but they had not been designed with Saddam Hussein in mind. In fact, they had been designed starting with a challenge from 40 years earlier. See, with the beginning of the Cold War, the Americans were long faced with the challenge of what to do if the balloon ever went up and the Russians came flooding across the Northern Plains. 
they could certainly outnumber us. And short of using nuclear weapons, there was no apparent way of slowing them. Therefore, a new doctrine was required. The doctrine that the United States came up with was in fact supported by new weapon systems, which under the Reagan administration were brought to bear and the operation executed in the sands of Iraq instead of the plains of Northern Germany. Saddam Hussein had little chance against what was not just state of the art. These were beyond state of the art. They were now the greatest fighting force on earth, the greatest capabilities, and they were on display on CNN every night. And unfortunately for Saddam Hussein, they were on display right in his backyard. The outcome was more than predictable. The fourth largest army in the world was quickly decimated. And for 100 hours, they were pummeled from the air, from the land, and they were destroyed. Many Iraqis were quoted as saying they never saw the rounds that hit them before knocking out 17 of their 20 tanks. A ceasefire was negotiated on the 1st of March and Operation Desert Storm was halted at exactly 100 hours by order of the president. It is difficult to measure the magnitude of the difference between the Iraqi army and the coalition forces, primarily those of the United States. But in perhaps the simplest of comparisons, the killed numbers in Desert Storm kind of tell the story. Coalition forces lost a grand total of some 341 personnel, most from the United States, but then most were, the United States represented the predominance of the forces in the coalition. The Iraqi forces were not quite so meager. I don't know what that percentage comes out to, but it certainly does not favor Iraq. After the 100 hours of fighting on the land, the Iraqi army was reduced from number four in the world to number 57 in the world and totally immobilized. There were, however, flies in the ointment. It is true that the land fight in Kuwait was stopped at 100 hours. However, the outcome was more than evident well before that. And as Iraqi forces fled north on the only highway that led from Kuwait to Baghdad, they were mercilessly pummeled by coalition forces. The slaughter was horrendous. But at the end of it, at the end of 100 hours, uh, the president declared a halt and was later uh, interviewed and supported it by saying that this was necessary to ensure that the war was ended and that Saddam Hussein and the uh, Iraqi forces would no longer be a threat to the stability of the region. A second fly in the ointment. In Northern Iraq, there is an ethnic people known as the Kurds. The Kurds have long claimed uh, independence, although they've never been given it. And they have fought to gain their independence during Desert Storm. They were difficult to say. It was either implied or spoken that the United States would support an uprising against the Iraqi government at this time. The Kurds happily concurred and they rose up, but American support never arrived. And as a result, those Kurds who were now identified and in the open were met by generals still loyal to Saddam Hussein and they were slaughtered. 
And finally, the very fact that Saddam Hussein was left in power. Even after the seven weeks of Desert Storm and, and Desert Shield and all of the atrocities of everything else, the uh, Iran-Iraq war, Saddam Hussein was left in power. It was felt that he had been defanged, his military was no longer functional, and to eliminate him would have created a vacuum that would have been less than beneficial to the region. Some 15 years would pass before Iraq would formally recognize Kuwait sovereignty and withdraw any claims to Iraq or to Kuwait. But as it turned out, Saddam Hussein would not be there to see it. In 2003, it was decided that he was in fact a threat to the stability in the region. He was ousted from power. He was captured, turned over to his own people, put on trial for war crimes to include the lighting up of Kuwaiti oil fields and summarily executed in 2003. This did create the expected vacuum in Iraq and the region. Iraq fell into disarray and chaos. The United States sent in occupation troops for eight years with limited success and finally withdrew in 2011 with the country no further along in stabilization than it had been at the beginning. And for the 10 years since to the present day, the country has faced large scale chaos, invasion by terrorist groups, insurrection by its people, and general disunity and a failure to get their feet on the ground towards progress. Famously, George Bush Jr. in 2003, who led the removal of Saddam Hussein, declared mission accomplished. It may have been for US forces, but for the Iraqi people, they are still awaiting a mission accomplished to recover themselves some stability uh, and the ability to move forward in progress and peace in their own country. The Middle East has proven to be a land that has drawn historical events. And each has come in their own time, made their impact, and then slowly disappeared into the sands of the region. And so it is likely that any good that was done by Desert Storm is fleeting and is disappearing as well, awaiting the next movement of progress for and for Iraq. But what of the new world order? The United States in, uh, in, back in 1991 had felt, or back in 1989, had felt that with the dissolution of the Soviet empire, the United States had won the grand chess match. They were the last man standing. They were the last superpower standing. And they should have the power now to create a new utopia. Unfortunately, that did not happen because it turned out that the world simply is not ready for a utopia. And there was not just one chess match. In fact, what came to pass was the realization that there are many chess matches against many opponents, large and small, recurring and anew. And they will continue on for the foreseeable future, challenging the United States and the peace of the world in general for the foreseeable future. Still, there are lessons to be learned from Desert Storm and from the New World Order. The first one is that the New World Order was exposed. There will be no Pax Americana, no power on earth can bring together all the nations of the earth as far back as Cain and Abel. If you got something, somebody else is gonna want it. And so it was, and so it remains. The likelihood of a 
new world order in which we all work as a peaceable kingdom towards mutual progress and peace is nowhere in sight. However, in the meantime, the second lesson is that coalitions are good. Unilateral action, even by a superpower, is likely to lead to problems. Coalitions work, coalitions are good, but coalitions are hard. It is hard to bring together nations in a single cause. And this is why the unity, the unifying of 39 nations by Jim Baker and President Bush are, is all the more remarkable in hindsight that they were able to do this and create a working operational coalition that successfully led to the end of Operation Desert Storm. But the opponents continue. They are real, they are dangerous, and they're foreign coalitions too. They will always be out there, always being flies in the ointment, but also directly challenging the top gun in the world. Just like in the old Western movies, there's always somebody else coming in to want to test the top gun. And a new Cold War is on right now, and we all know it with China. This will continue. And regardless of the outcome of this Cold War, there will be a Cold War afterwards, because that is the way of the world in the past, in the present, and on into the future. This has been the Silver Sides Lecture presentation of Operation Desert Storm. And if you, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question, we'd be very happy to. And I know Kurt's got questions. <laughs> you always got questions. questions. I'd be glad to. Ron, as always, fabulous uh, lecture. You led us to a great semester, su summation here. So the simplest of questions, was it worth it? Did the ends justify the means? And we're making that decision 31 years later, of course, with hindsight. You know, and this harkens to the cancellation of Confederate generals and the honoring of past events and even saying George Washington. You know, you deal with the cards you have at the time. It was believed in 1991 that Saddam Hussein represented a true threat to the stability of, a, of an area that was of supreme importance. We were not uh, oil uh, independent at that time. Neither was most of the world. Yes, it was worth it. Yes, it was. Excellent. And I love your statement. You deal with the cards or the information you have at the time. Perfect. I'm a history guy. Yeah, we talk about that a lot at the museum because you can take something as innocuous as smoking by the um, by the enlisted and the officers during World War II and the kids are like, oh, smoking's bad. I'm like, no, you have to look at it at the time. There was not, you can't interpret their actions in our lens today. You have to interpret in what they knew and what they felt and what they believed at that point. Hey, when I went through a two month ranger course of survival where I was getting an average of two to three hours of sleep for two months. I chewed tobacco, Peggy. I really did. <laughs> I never chewed it before. I never chewed it after. But by golly, I chewed it during that just to stay awake. Oh, yes. <laughs> hey, um, do we have any other questions out there? So um, while we're waiting for other people to think of things too that they might like to ask, what do you feel that the outcome there in terms of the power of the United Nations? Because we, you know, we may have been the head of the coalition that went in, but truly it was the United Nations that called for this to be done with. You know, the United Nations, how to be diplomatic. Nations represents the best of people. Unfortunately, people don't always act like the best of people. Now, certainly, 
to see someone doing wrong and saying, hey, you're doing wrong, which they did against uh, Saddam Hussein as he invaded Kuwait, was a worthwhile, it was a laudable, honorable thing to do. But they could not have done it if they didn't have the United States standing behind them with a big old stick saying, or else. Mm -hmm. You think Saddam Hussein would have withdrawn if the United States had not been part of the coalition? I, you know, who knows, but I don't think they would have. I, I doubt it either because I think it was a game of chicken that yeah. who would actually stand up and who would not. And was the rest of the world willing to pay attention to this little tiny country that, and he was, I think, surprised by the fact that they were very surprised by it. We need the United Nations. We need the moral compass. We need the, the better angels of our nature to borrow from Shara. You know, we need to know that there is a right thing to do that we all agree upon. And like a geopolitical church, the UN provides that for us. But there needs to be more mm -hmm. until people become more like the angels and less like <laughs> the demons they sometimes act like. Yes. Um, I... I was a surprise, though, but um, I don't. Russia decided that they were willing to stand back and not become involved. And that um, really shows to their weakness at this particular point in their restructuring and their attempt to um, bring in their own problems at home to a closure. And I yeah. found that very interesting. And when you said, though, that while everyone else was heading off to the Middle East there, you were standing on alert, waiting for... <laughs> potentially bad things to happen. Yes, I was, uh, I was part of a weapon system that was equally as accurate as the Tomahawk cruise missile. Mm -hmm. We could drop a nuclear warhead into Red Square and hit a dumpster from Germany. Wow. And it was very, made very clear, Russia, Soviet Union, you said stay out, do that stay out because yes i'm thinking man if you could hit a dumpster in red square 30 years ago what must they be able to do today it boggles the imagination it just absolutely boggles the imagination on that one do we have any other questions from the audience this evening if not, I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. We enjoy having your presence. And all of you that know the Silver Sides, it's our mission to honor veterans. And we do that through education and preservation. And this is one of our educational outreaches. And we appreciate your time and coming out to listen to these presentations. And I hope to encourage you to, we only have a few of them left. And I would really like you guys to everyone to bring a friend or tell someone about it that is interested so that they can enjoy some of these wonderful lectures that we have on military history each and every week. We look forward to seeing you all again next week and um, have a very nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Okay. Thanks, Gerd. See ya. Bye-bye, all. Goodbye. <laughs>